خدا کا شکر ہے جو مسیح میں ہم کو ہمیشہ اسیروں کی طرح گش کراتا ہے اور اپنے علم کی خوشبو ہمارے وسیلہ سے ہر جگہ پھیلاتا ہے مسیح یسو کے عظیم بابر کا جلالی نام میں آپ تمام نیشنل نیوز دیکھنے والوں پر خدا ان کی سلامتی ہو میں ہوں بابر ایمینول میں آپ کو ویلکم کرتا ہوں پروگرام خدا ان کی آواز میں آج خدا ان کی آواز کی خدمت کو سر انجام دینے کے لیے ہمارے ساتھ موجود ہیں پاسٹر اینتھنی ان کا تعلق ہے جرمنی سے یہ وہاں پر پاسٹر انچارج ہیں ان کے چرچ کا نام ہے ایلپ کرچی جو وہاں پر ایک دریا ہے جس کے نام سے یہ چرچ ہے اور دریا آپ کو پتہ ہے کہ ہمیشہ بہتا رہتا ہے اور ایک شہر کی ایک جگہ کی وہ مین ضرورت ہوتا ہے اور پانی آپ جیسے ہم سب جانتے ہیں کہ پانی انسانی اور جتنی بھی نباتات ہیں ان کے لیے ایک خاص نحمت کے طور پر ہے اور یہ دریا ہمیشہ اسی طرح سے بہتا رہتا ہے تو آج خدا ان کی زندہ آواز کو ہم پاسٹر اینتھنی کے وسیلہ سے سنیں گے ہیلو ڈیئر ویورس اراؤنڈ دا ورلڈ آئی ایم ویری ہیپی ٹو ناؤ شیئر دا ورڈ آف گاڈ ود یو آئی ول ٹاک اباؤٹ ٹو ویز ٹو بی لاسٹ اینڈ ہاؤ ٹو بی فاؤنڈ اینڈ آئی ووڈ لائک ٹو اسٹارٹ دس سرمن ود اے پریئر فار می اینڈ فار یو Heavenly Father, thank you that you have spoken to us through your holy word. Um, thank you that it is life-giving and life-changing. And I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would help me now to deliver this message, but also that you would help all viewers and listeners to be attentive and that you would open their hearts to receive your truth. We do this all for the glory of your name. Amen. One of the basic questions and the most important question for every human being is, how can I have a right relationship to God? It depends and it determines our eternal destiny, but also the quality of our life, how we relate to God. And I want to share with you today a parable or a story that uh, the prophet Jesus told. It captures the essence of what a right relationship with God looks like. And he did this by showing us and distinguishing two wrong ways of relating to God and then to show us how the right way to relate to God looks like. Two wrong ways of relating to God means two ways of being lost and the right way of relating to God is the way of being found. The occasion when Jesus shared this story was that he was criticized by Pharisees. Pharisees were very religious and devout Uh, Jews. They believed in God, they lived a good life, and they had a problem with Jesus. And the problem was that Jesus was eating and welcoming sinners, people who don't, did not look like they have a good relationship with God, people who were living immoral lives. And they said, how can Jesus do this? How can he be with people who are so unlike God? And I will read now the story. We find it in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Then Jesus said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. After a few days, the younger son gathered together all he had and left on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth with a wild lifestyle. Then, after he had spent everything, a severe famine took place in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and worked for one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He was longing to eat the carob pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have food enough to spare? But here I am dying from hunger. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way from home, his father saw him and his heart went out to him. He ran and hugged his son and kissed him. Then his son said to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Hurry, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. As he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the slaves and asked, what was happening? The slave replied, your brother has returned and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has got his son back safe and sound. But the older son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and appealed to him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have worked like a slave for you and I never disobeyed your commands. Yet you never gave me even a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured our assets with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me and everything that belongs to me is yours. It was appropriate to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. I want to share with you two ways to be lost. And the first way to be lost is the obvious one. It is what everyone sees in this parable. It is the way of the younger son. Look what the younger son does here. He goes to his father and says, I want my inheritance now. Give me my inheritance now. Now this is a terrible thing to say for a son. It is very disrespectful of his father. Basically he's saying to his father, I want you to be dead because when you're dead, I get your inheritance. I don't care about you. I want the inheritance. And the father in the story is the picture for God. So basically the younger son is saying, father or God, you are a means for me to get something. I am more interested in the goods I can get than in God. I am more interested in the gifts I can get than in the giver. I am only interested in what I can get out of you, but not in you yourself. And the next thing he does is that he decides to leave. He leaves his father. This is the move of independence from God wanting to get away from God, to be free from God. He's going to a far, far country. He does not want to see his father. He does not want to be with his father. He wants his own life. He wants his independence. Basically what he's doing is that he's making himself God. He's saying, I am my God. I decide for my life. And his pleasures are his God. He's looking for the pleasures he can get out in the world with his riches. So many people nowadays live like the younger son. It is so attractive to go out there and to live a life of pleasure. And there is a lure of riches and indulging in the pleasures of this world. So many people today choose to run from God. And very often it is connected uh, with breaking from the community, like the younger son. He breaks with his family and his friends. He leaves them all behind. He breaks with tradition. He breaks with authority and he breaks with morality. And many of us in our world today are doing this. But as the father says, it is a lifestyle that is a lifestyle of being lost and being dead because it is selfish. The younger son thinks only about himself. It is an immoral lifestyle he's leading. This is the obvious way to be lost and to rebel against God. But this story is much deeper than this, because now Jesus is showing us that there is a more hidden way to be lost, a way that we often cannot recognize so easily. And this is the way of the older son. We might think the older son is a good guy, isn't he? He is a good son. He is an example for everyone. He does not rebel. He respects his father. 
He never disobeys us, he says. He is a moral person. He is an upright person. He works very, very hard. He is conscientious. He is productive. And he stays with the father, not like the younger son who runs away. The older son, he looks to be very close to God, very devout, very religious. Traditionally, this parable is called the parable of the lost son, which means that there is only one son who is lost. Why do I say there are two lost sons? Why do I say both are lost? Well, I want to share with you the signs that the older son also is a lost son. The first sign we see in the story is that he is full of envy. He is envious of his younger son. He says, the younger son, for him, my father, he, he sacrifices the best calf, the fattened calf. He celebrates a huge celebration, but I could never celebrate with my friends. He is envious of his younger, son, uh, younger brother. Also, he has a sense of entitlement, which means that he says, I deserve to be treated better. I deserve to have more. Look how much I have done. Look how hard I have worked. You know, I deserve you treat me better. That is his sense of entitlement towards his father. And also, he is a very angry son. He is angry at his brother. His brother doesn't deserve this. Look what his brother did wrong. How he rejected the family. How he rejected the father. How immorally he lived. And now, He's just received back like that and he's given all these things. So we see that the older brother, who at first looks very upright and, and devout and good and close to God, he is a person with no gratitude. He is a person with no joy. He is a person with no love for his father or for his brother. And now in the story, he is outside and the younger son is inside with the celebration. The roles are reversed. The older son has become the new lost son who is outside and the younger son is inside with the father celebrating. So what does this reveal about the relationship the older son has to his father? Actually, the older son doesn't see his father like a real father, but he sees his father like a master. He is serving and working for him so that he can get something back. He has a, he's in a contract with his father, but not in a real relationship. So you see, it is possible to be a very devout, a very religious person. It is possible to do very Christian things, and it looks like you are very close to God. But in your heart, you are far, far away. And this is what Jesus is telling the Pharisees. He is saying, your life looks amazing. It looks so good on the outside. But on the inside, you are far from God. You are like the older son. And that's why there are two ways to be lost. There is the obvious way everybody can see. You rebel, you reject God, you run away, you are independent, you live immoral, you live only for your pleasure. But there is a hidden way to run from God. It is by fulfilling all expectations, by being a good person, and by believing in God and working hard for him, but you do this all only to get something from God. You're trying to put a demand on God so he owes you something. You are not doing it out of gratitude for God. You are not doing it out of love for God. But you want to earn the blessings and earn the riches and gifts. You are using God as a means to a higher end, which is your own pleasure and advantage. So you see, in the end, there is actually a deep similarity between the younger son and the older son. The younger son says, give me your inheritance. And the older son says, give me my pay. Both of them don't want the father, don't want the relationship with the father. They want only what they can get from him. So these are two wrong ways to relate to God, two ways to be lost. So how is the right way to be related to God? How can we be found? Because this, after all, is what Jesus wants us all to get to. The third way, and the right way to relate to God, is a way of grace. It is the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not through being immoral and irreligious, and it is not through being moral or religious, but by relating to God as a father, 
through the grace of Jesus Christ. Now look what a wonderful father this is. Jesus paints this beautiful, touching and moving picture of the love of God and the grace of God. Let's look at it in the story. The first thing the father does is he grants his child freedom. He could be so angry with his younger son. He could say, no way you're getting your inheritance. I will punish you. You are staying here. But he is a gracious father. He gives his son the freedom to leave and he even gives him his, his inheritance. But when he lets him go, he does not turn his back on the son and say, I don't care about you. You are no longer my son. He has a deep longing in his heart. He is longing every single day for his son to come back. He is full of deep, deep love. And then when his son returns, he is already waiting. He's already looking. He's already got his arms open. And the moment he sees his son coming, what does he do? He runs. Now, if you know something about the culture back then, someone who is a patriarch, a man of honor, an old and wise man, he will not run. He will wait for the younger son to come. But this father, he is, loves his son so much. He does not care about his honor. He does not care what other people think. He runs to his son because he is so, so happy to see him again. And then he is so affectionate, isn't he? He hugs his son. He kisses his son. Now remember, so the son has just been with the pigs. He is stinky. He is dirty. He is not in a good state, but the father doesn't care. He embraces him and kisses him and says, I love you. And then he does a miraculous thing. The father does something which is totally shocking. He accepts his son back, not as a servant, but as a true and real son. He gives him the ring and the robe and the sandals, saying, you are 100% my son. I accept you back as my son and not as a servant. This is absolutely amazing. He honors his son rather than shaming him. And he brings him back to glory. And it is the father who has to pay the price for this. Because remember that the son squandered all the money. It is gone now. And when the father reaccepts him, he will probably regain an inheritance. But it is the father who pays this price. Now in the real world, this is the world of the parable, it is always God who pays a price when he forgives us. But the price that God paid to forgive us and accept us as his sons was not the price of money, but it was the price of the life of his only son, Jesus Christ. He had to die on the cross, and that was the price God paid to accept us as his sons. It is truly amazing grace. Now we see the love of the father for the younger son, but the love of the father for the older son is just as deep and just as real, because he loves both, both of his lost sons. And the older son, he is outside. What does the father do? The father could say, oh, you need to come inside. I will stay inside. But the father goes out. Again, he is seeking the lost. He's saying, I will go to you. I will find people. I want to reach out to you to bring you back in. And so he goes out and he does not force his older son, but he talks to him on an eye to eye level. And then he says this absolutely amazing statement to the older son. He says, look, Everything I have belongs to you. Everything I have belongs to you. This is amazing grace. The father says, I share everything with you. There's nothing I hold back. Basically, he's saying to the older son, you cannot earn anything from me and you do not need to earn anything from me because I will give you everything just like that. It's a gift of grace. And this is the real way to relate to God. You cannot come to God if you bargain. If you say, I will give you this and then you give me this back. You can only come to God if you accept grace, which means you accept that God gives you everything and you did not deserve it and you did not earn it at all. Now, how do you enter into this wonderful relationship with the Father? How do you receive this grace? It is through the work of repentance. Repentance means changing the direction of your heart towards God. In this story, it happens with the younger son first. He realizes he, has, he is in poverty. He is cut off from his family, from God, and he's in a very bad state. And his repentance starts with the first step away from the pigs and towards his father. The very first step is a step of repentance, and it brings him in the right direction towards God. And that is how we receive grace. 
Now with the older son, we actually do not know how he reacts, right? The story does not tell us. The older son, he's standing outside and he's discussing with the father. But the father is asking him and pleading with him, please come inside to the celebration, move towards me. And this is the invitation God is bringing to all of us, to me and to you and to all people everywhere, also to very religious and good people. He's saying, turn away and come to me. It is an open invitation. It means that we need to let go of our demands and our claims and even our achievements and receive God's undeserved grace and gift of forgiveness, of honor, of community, and of joy. I have experienced this in my own life. This is a very, very powerful thing. When you enter into the grace of God, it brings so much gratitude into your life. It brings so much joy into your life. It brings so much honor into your life. You become a son of the living God. Everything he has, he shares with you. It is wonderful. It is life-changing. It frees you from so many things and pressures in this world where you need to prove yourself, you need to earn, you need to be something, you need to be successful. But God wants to just grace you and gift you with being a son of God. And there is nothing better in the world than just being that, knowing you are loved and cherished and safe in the grace of God. Now, this is my heart's desire for you to experience this really in your life. And for this, I would like to pray for you that you would experience this grace. Heavenly Father, you are so amazing. Your love is so deep. Your grace covers all sins. It is unimaginable. And I thank you so much that your love searches for us. It goes to the faraway places and it offers us invitation and honor and glory and forgiveness, all for free, all because you paid for it, because we can't. And I want to pray for everyone who is watching this, who is listening now, wherever they are in the world, that you would grant them this grace, that they would experience the repentance and the adoption as sons of God, and that it would free them into unimaginable joy and celebration and gratitude, like we see it in the story. Holy Spirit, this is a work only you can do, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you would make it real and that you would really bury this truth deep in the hearts of people that they will experience their adoption and a new identity in you. For your glory and for your name's sake, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.